Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us. This is an hour dedicated to understanding a little more about ourselves, our beliefs, and how we approach enlightenment. Indeed, an hour devoted to learning something more, not just about the world we live in, but about how, what, and why we think as we do. An hour for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind who we are and who we might become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, last week, we had a rather interesting show. It was all about remote viewing. Instead of going to someone who professes a little knowledge of remote viewing, uh, what I decided to do was go to the man that commanded the military's remote viewing espionage unit at SRA, Stanford Research Associates, thrice decorated for his work, Major Ed Dames. The show sparked off quite a bit of mail and somewhat of a controversy. Before I go to our letters, let me frame a context behind calling upon dames to come to our show. Everyone out there addressing consciousness and specifically mind operating at a distance will cite at some point the work of Dr. Harold Putoff or Ingo Swan. Now, put off for his work at SRA and remote viewing, as well as for his work with random number generators. Swan, on the other hand, for his unerring accuracy that made remote viewing a credible endeavor, even for our military. Now, <clears throat> Swan taught Dames remote viewing, but Dames was over both put off and Swan. So we went directly, if you will, to the horse's mouth. Michael wrote, Eldon, I just listened to your show with Major Ed Dames. Initially, I was very disturbed about the content. You seem to give him a lot of credibility. I did some very basic research, and the first thing I noticed is that many of his predictions had been wrong. The solar flare prediction, which was the natural disaster he predicts for next year, has really been out there for over 10 years. Normally, you are very thorough in asking a tough question, but you didn't really seem to question him about a number of his failed predictions. He and many of his so-called team have been sued and have had many uh, and have made all kinds of predictions about Hale-Bopp Comet, none of which came true. I know your shows tend to fly by, but I'm curious why you didn't challenge him more on all of his failed predictions. What do you understand about his track record? I heard his nickname is Dr. Doom. So I am just curious about how much you personally have vetted him. I understand a topic like remote viewing can take two hours to get your arms around, but the unsuspecting or gullible, to them, they might very well buy his predictions and alter their lives based on the comments of a guy who has been making failed predictions for a couple of decades now. Another prediction he made on your show that he discussed is the nuclear incident with North Korea, I found out that he has been making that prediction for over 20 years. What can you tell us about predictions he has made that have come true? I answered Michael this way. <clears throat> we simply ran out of time. Dames has a record of both some very interesting hits and errors. On coast to coast, he forecast the Japanese nuclear crisis very accurately. Everyone thought this forecast was impossible because of the strength built into those reactors. When he originally spoke of a nuclear event in Korea, it too was discounted because how on earth would North Korea ever get a nuclear weapon? Not unlike a psychic, he has several other accurate hits to mix with his misses. Now, his service in our intelligence community is undeniable, as are his three still classified decorations, and his work with his so-called counterpart in Russia has even further ramifications of great interest. We will be bringing him back to discuss his record in the near future. This show was supposed to be about remote viewing and the SRA, his work with Swan and Putoff. I wanted to explore Killshot and candidly, when he said it was coming in 2013, I was taken by surprise. The film has no such date in it, and interestingly, it also contains numerous statements that insist on the inability to tell time since, quote, mind is out of time, close quote. I also wanted to ask him about mind being out of time, 
when time is a reference used by him over and over as a marker to say, as he did, look at Eldon on a certain date. There are other apparent contradictions, such as the use of the holographic universe as a model for all events, forward and backward with respect to time, and then his, quote, can't determine time, close quote, at least in the future position. Next time, we'll flesh this one out more fully. Ben wrote, Major Ed Dames was totally fascinating and one of your best, having experienced remote viewing and sending and receiving of thoughts at Romp the School of Enlightenment. I realize how real this is. His predictions are very congruent with Romp the's predictions, which, frankly, I have never taken seriously. I'm very interested in looking into this further, although I hope his predictions are wrong. Great show. Well, now remember, Ben, I told him on the air, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, that we would have him back in 2014 to discuss his 2013 predictions. Mercedes wrote, Hello, Mr. Taylor. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you for such a wonderful show, Provocative Enlightenment. But I must say, this last show has left me quite shocked. I found Major Dame's predictions very interesting, yet I don't know if I should could agree. All I want to do is recommend that the people that felt like me after listening to his insight read the, la- read the last chapter of Doreen Virtue's book, the light worker's way since this might make them feel much better. Thanks for sharing all of those wonderful topics on provocative enlightenment. Okay. Now Mercedes consciousness does make a real difference. No question about it. At least in my view that said, my mother used to extol an ancient virtue. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Loretta wrote, great show today. So much information I have not heard about before. I love learning. I love this show. One hour just isn't enough. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for your insight and wonderful guests. Sonny wrote, dear Eldon, it's been a while since I have been given to write as I have been working hard with spirit on deciphering my own life story and mission statement. However, I managed to catch your last program about the end of the world with your guest, Major Ed Dames, retired. I found the program interesting, yet despite my own impressions that your guest meant no harm and even offered us all further validation of a belief in psychic phenomenon as utilized by many governments and more, still I had to question his own expertise and wonder how would he not consider his own lack of awareness as an intelligence gatherer when seeking to gain intelligence from a universal mind source that is God. It seems a no-brainer to ask, would a divine source who has stated, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and has told us once that no man on earth, nor angel in heaven will know when the end will come, and stated even at that time that his was an unchanging hand, why then would he seek to change that now so that any person may then believe that they are so privileged to know? Well... You know, thanks for the letter, Sonny. But the fact is, Dames is not forecasting end times. Rather, he is reporting on seeing a major catastrophic event. Now, major may be understated, but it is a major catastrophic event due to solar activity of an unprecedented nature, at least in recorded history. Uh, Indeed, uh, it's my understanding that there are many safe houses, sanctuaries that governments uh, of this world have in place and that dames and his people and many others also have in place in the event that there are solar flares and other events that could lead to the woeful demise of this, that, and the other. But, you know, before continuing, I have to say this. In my opinion, the doomsday sayers are all wrong. This world, like any good school, will continue to exist until it's no longer needed. And from the looks of things, that's not going to happen any day soon. Susan wrote, I have so enjoyed hearing some of your radio interviews. I look forward to hearing more and, of course, seeing where and why our synchronicity connection flows. Jasper wrote, I love your shows. I love your books. I am passionate about your Intertalk CDs. They have helped me in so many ways. I saw you post on your Facebook page that your favorite prayer was thank you. So I will just say thank you. Well, Jasper, I'll just have to say back to you. You're more than welcome, sir. Linda wrote, thank you. I have purchased your CDs in the past and they are great. Angel wrote, 
Your cancer CD saved my mom's life seven years ago. Thank you again. All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your email to Eldon at eldentaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. We can't get all of your letters on the air, but they do impact our programming, and once again, I thank you for your feedback and continued support. Now to today's show, Aging Gracefully. You know, we live in a world where emphasis seems to be on youth. Everything has an emphasis on being young, staying young, looking young, being vital, and so forth. The search for the fountain of youth is still very much alive. But today we search with gene manipulation, DNA coding, chemistry, etc., etc. And then we deploy our aversion to aging in various ways, ranging from cosmetic surgery to good old-fashioned denial. So since we all age, what's the big deal about aging? I mean, in some cultures, the elderly are held in very high regard. For some, the aged look is the wise look. Indeed, in some cultures where age is highly valued, one might even dye their hair gray. With age should come some distinction. I have heard it said that we should welcome age and remember just how lucky we are, for many have not had the pleasure to grow old. I've also heard it said that only the brave dare to grow old, implying the discomfort that comes with age. Years ago, you know, a study was conducted in upstate New York by Ellen Langer, where older people were isolated with others their own age in a lodge in the woods. The surroundings in the lodge were all from an earlier era, one uh, that for this group of subjects placed them back in their 20s. The music, the photos, the magazines, and so forth all were from this earlier era. When the week was up, the investigators made a post-test of physical agility and strength, together with appearance ratings, and the subjects had all substantially younged or reversed their age. The role of expectation, memory, and belief has an incredible influence over the body. Indeed, I remember running a small pilot study a few years ago using one of our intertalk programs that is titled Quantum Younging, You've heard Ravinder talk about that one on the air before. Some of the before and after pictures were striking, and all of the reports suggested that mind definitely had a role in how we aged. So what is the appropriate approach to aging? Aging gracefully. I know no one better qualified to discuss this than a woman whose beauty has dazzled millions and continues to do so as she naturally ages into her 70s. I'm speaking, of course, of Linda Evans. Linda has been with us before, and you all loved her, so we have brought her back. She is a favorite of mine to speak with. Her words are always candid and from the heart. By way of introduction for anyone who might not be familiar with award-winning actress Linda Evans, she has personified beauty and grace to American television viewers for over five decades, from her role as Audra Barkley on Big Valley to the glamorous Crystal Carrington on Dynasty, the Hell's Kitchen, which she won in 2009. She has won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in a Television Drama Series and has won five People's Choice Awards for Best Female Performer. She was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series. And for her contribution to the television industry, Linda has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. After Dynasty, she moved from Hollywood to the Pacific Northwest, where she began an extraordinary journey of self-discovery. But recently, she has returned to performing frequently, starring in the stage play Legends. Linda's often lavish and luxurious life has rivaled Crystal Carrington. She has dined with queens and presidents, been romanced by the rich and famous. And today, what Linda treasures most is the wisdom she has gained along the way. If you would like to speak with Linda. Today's your chance. You can do that by phoning 866-254-1579 and international callers can dial their country code then 760-918-4300. So let's get her in here. Welcome back to Provocative Enlightenment, Linda Evans. Well, thank you, Eldon. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I love your mind. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. Listen, I have to ask you this before we get in, because I wanted to ask you last time, but but the show just got by. I got interested in everything you were talking about. 
Uh, so this is a bit of an aside. But one of my favorite movies is The Legend of Tom Horn. One of my favorite actors was Steve McQueen. And you start against or, you know, opposite Steve McQueen. During your last visit to the show, you shared what it was like to work with many of the actors. What was it like to work with McQueen? It was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. He, Firstly, he appeared to be starring in it, but in fact, he it was his baby, his project for many, many, many years. Um, he attended to every detail on it. He chose... He went with me to Western Costume Company and chose every fabric that I would wear in my outfit, every horse, every bit of equipment that was used in the film, Steve personally chose. It was something that he, a movie that he loved, that he wanted to make. He said he'd made a lot of successful movies for the studios and that it was time for him to do something that was from his heart. It was a passion of his to make this movie for many years. And so... It was exciting to work with him because, firstly, he told me um, when I showed up for the interview that he was sorry that I came because I was wrong for the part, and he told my agent that. But since I was there (laughs) and I had to come without any makeup on, that he said, okay, come on in and we'll talk. And, of course, wonderful life as it would have it, he gave me the part. Um, And you were perfect, I might add. I was so wanting to do that movie that uh, before we went to film it, I got so nervous because I'd heard that a few people were fired after they came to do the movie um, and that he didn't feel they turned out the way that he wanted uh, them to be in it, that I got laryngitis and I couldn't talk. And when I showed up to work, I could hardly speak. And he was beautiful. He took me aside and he said, I understand, he said, as successful as I am, I'm nervous every time I go to work, every time I understand the sensitivity of an actor and the vulnerability of coming to work. He said, you go to your room, we were out on location, he said, don't talk to anybody for a week, and you come back in a week on the set. And I came back, and my voice was gravelly, but I did the film and he couldn't have been more compassionate and understanding. Great film. I, I, it's, it, 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 I truly enjoy that. It's one of my favorite. Uh, I, I happen to love Westerns, but it was very well done. You, you know, let's get to the subject now. You were on Oprah with Sybil Shepherd, and you candidly discussed your own struggle with aging. Right. You lecture, and one of, one of your speaking engagement topics is all about aging gracefully so you know please share the story uh, of your own experience with plastic surgery i mean let's start there uh the decision you made at the age of 50 and and what you would tell someone today if they were looking down those alternatives okay well firstly it's such a personal thing because your choice to do it or not do it you're going to have to live with. And so anyone else's experience, you can take it in your mind and you can say, okay, this worked for them, but is it going to work for me? Firstly, I think it's the reason that you're going to do it that's the most important. I have friends who have never had any plastic surgery, and they are so comfortable in their skin with themselves and their lives. It's There's no reason they want to to do it. There's no reason to do it. Um, I did it. I was in love with a younger man, and most of my life uh, I've been in the public eye, and it seemed like something I could do that would be simple and that would, would work for me. So I chose to do it, and and I had good results because I went to the finest. I always say to women, if you want to do it just because it feels like it would make you happy to have this younger looking face or not to have to deal with something that you see when you look in the mirror, find out who is the best. Find out who has been. 
See what they look like. Don't just take someone's word that we are the best and we do this because there's as many bad um, uh, experiences as there are good because there's so many people who say that they do it and they don't do it well. So you really have to investigate it. But most importantly, find out your reasons for it. Find out what in you will be happier for it. Yeah, you know, I, I understand that uh, you were with Yanni, I believe, at the time. And and uh, so, I mean, I relate to uh, your desire to uh, appear to be younger. Uh, but you're, you've been public that you regretted doing it as well. Do you want to flesh that out for us? Well, when I say regretted, not all things that you do turn out perfectly. And so... There are many, some women have themselves done and done and done and done, and then your face gets tight and you don't look natural. I mean, to me, beauty truly is from within. It truly is something we feel from someone, an essence of them, and then we also can look. I mean, the superficiality of needing to be young, read thin, no fat, show your arms, show your legs, do this, do that, uh, is is so much pressure. It creates such self-criticism in women. And with that self-criticism, we don't have any joy. We don't have any fun. I mean, I swear, if there's a room full of women and there's one in there, um, say there's 10 women and one of them uh, didn't plan her makeup or hair or didn't fix herself up but just came and the rest just spent days getting their outfits and everything done and ready... You'll walk into that room with the woman who did, who's just laughing and having fun, who's just full of life, who's expressing in herself and being joyful. That's what beauty is. The rest is just a package that we look at, but it's not something you want to live with or, or enjoy. If there's no joy in life because you're so busy thinking about what you look like to someone, uh, you need to get a life. You know, I want to flesh this out a little bit, uh, and, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you a couple of tough questions here, and this is provocative enlightenment. So before I do that, I'm going to cushion it a little bit, because we're coming up on a break anyway, and I'm going to ask you a question that my 14-year-old son wants me to ask you, okay? okay? For the record, Linda, this is the question. How does it feel to be so hot still at 70 years of age? Honest to goodness, that's my son's question. Well, firstly, what a beautiful son. Not because he thinks I'm hot, but because his mind goes that way to seeing beyond age or time. I mean, it's beautiful. That's absolutely my congratulations to you uh, for having such a beautiful son. But, um, you know, it isn't. And when you say hot, <clears throat> what exactly is hot? <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm not going to touch that one. He's not here. Fortunately, we have a hard break coming. But when I come back, I'm, I'm going to pursue this a little bit more. I agree with you. Beauty is from the inside. But, you know, there seems to be some esteem issues that could also be attached to our failure at recognizing what beauty really is. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment on HayHouseRadio.com, radio that goes anywhere and everywhere. Our guest today is the one and only Linda Evans, and we're discussing aging gracefully. You can check out her blog at LindaEvansOfficial.com forward slash blog. Now, if you're not already in our chat room, this is a great time to join in the conversation. We have a short film for you today. Just go to EldenTaylor.com forward slash chat. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss what's coming up after these words from some of our friends. Do you feel like you've become lost in a funhouse? Only seeing the reflection of yourself, past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you? I invite you to step through the doorway and onto the path leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Elton Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions, now expanded, updated, and revised, 
It will provide you with real life examples of how you can break free from your current perceptions and begin your journey to how high is up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes and Noble. Close your eyes. Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self images with I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, Inner Talk has repeatedly been proven effective at changing your self talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I N N E R T A L K dot com. Innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're speaking with Linda Evans about aging gracefully. But before we get back to today's show, I want to remind you to join me on Facebook as a friend or a fan. You'll always know where we are and what's on next when you do. Plus, many of the announcements only happen on my Facebook pages or in my newsletter. So if you're not receiving your free copy of the newsletter, be sure to sign up for it when you visit my website. All right, let's get back to the show. Before the break, I suggested I was going to ask you a tough question, Linda, and I cushioned that by first asking my sons. But here's where we go. Um, You know, if uh, we have talked before, and, and I have done my homework, and if I look at your life, I can see what would be the appearance of some serious esteem issues. You initially were hesitant uh, about entering the field of acting. You didn't feel that that was something you could do. It was kind of thrust upon you. Uh, Your first husband left you for a 15-year-old. Your second husband played around. You're the most gorgeous lady out there, but you're dealing with these kinds of of problems or issues. So my question is this, and, and I don't mean this in any way to offend. How much esteem or how much of an esteem issue do you think was involved in your decision to have cosmetic surgery at the age of 50? And, and looking back on it, now in your later life with with who you are what would you tell your younger self uh about about that i mean would you can would you have done it again looking back on it now okay so my mind goes in many directions when you talk about esteem because it's not just plastic surgery no yes i know it's all over our entire lives and you're absolutely accurate um, there were esteem issues. I was shy as a child, and I didn't like getting up in front of people because I was shy, and it is a self-esteem issue, shyness. Um, and like everyone, like everyone, there are areas of my life as a woman that I am strong and powerful and areas that I'm vulnerable and have weaknesses. And Self-esteem is such a beautiful word because it's something you give yourself, not anybody else. And it's taken me many, many, many years not to have my value be defined by someone else. And I think that's something most women have to learn because they're caretakers and we, by nature, take care of others and put our mind, our love outside of ourselves and not to ourselves. So one of the beautiful things that happens when you get older is the wisdom you collect, because the game of life of being a hot young woman um, isn't quite there for you because your age or whatever is that is, you have a chance to pull away from the game of life that we use to define ourselves, such as what's outside of us, and we get to reflect a little more on 
who am I? What are my values? What do I like about myself? What am I? Um, absolutely, you're right. Uh, at 50, uh, right after Dynasty, I didn't have the time for that much reflection. <laughs> However, <clears throat> since then, I have a whole other perspective of life and myself. I don't regret a moment of what I've done in my life. It has given me the wisdom, the knowledge that is my favorite thing about myself. I have wisdom, as do, well, most people have wisdom when they get older if they stop and reflect. It's the contemplation. It's taking time to go inward. And um, I don't regret any of it. I look at life and I now see you're not a good person or a bad person if you do it. You're not right. You're not wrong. It's just a choice. The point is, is it something you want? Take the time to reflect on it. Find out why you want to do it, and then you'll never be sorry. So that would be the advice to the younger you now. Take the time to reflect upon it. Upon who you are, what you want it for, what you need it for. You know, it's like anything. Like if we're living to be 90, 100 years of age, and that's on the average, Mm -hmm. there are so many things we can do to keep ourselves young and healthy. And one of them is we can look it. It isn't going to extend our lives, but if it stresses us that we're aging, that we don't look the way we'd like to see when we look in the mirror, it makes us happy. If we could change this and we know someone who could do it, which would, you know, we know he's going to deliver or she's going to deliver that thing we would like to get rid of, that we would like to fix, even if it's your ears, your nose, whatever it is. If that makes you happy, do it. There's nothing right or wrong with it. You can do anything you want to do. It's that if you feel pressured to do it, so you'll be liked. If that's such an off place, you'll never even feel good after you do it. I love your candor, you know. Uh, a certain honesty about just being who you are. You know, hanging above my fireplace in my family room is a painting of an old Native American. It's all wrinkled and growly looking. My wife calls him grouchy. He is... Uh, Clearly weathered many years outdoors. Um, I, I look at him and think, you know, that's what I'm going to look like when I reach 100. Uh, I find these looks very natural and, and, and honest. Right. Now, he's a male. Do you think men have it easier than women when it comes to aging? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And you know something? It's okay. Let them have it easier. The point is, what do we want to do about it? Do we need to be with a man that needs us to look younger? That's the point. Do we need to be in society and be uh, uh, placed in a position where we're still hot when we're 70, 80, 90? Or can we just be who we are, love who we are, be comfortable in our own skin, and just enjoy life and let those who like it uh, be with us and let those who disagree be with each other in their way. There's nothing wrong with anybody's choice of how they want to be in life. It's just how do, you, how do we personally feel about it? How do we feel comfortable with our choices in life? One of the things that happens as you age is, of course, you experience many things, and sometimes those experiences are, are dreadful as we process them as we go through them it's my understanding uh that you delivered yourself out of depression uh, depression that was brought on by your sister's struggle with cancer uh, by using bioidentical hormones and you i mean uh, tell us about that experience and and do you continue to use the hormones today well it wasn't it's not exactly that simple um i truly uh had to make a lot of changes in my life. My sister's cancer, my other sister's heart problems, my best friend's macular degeneration were all issues that happened at one time that oh, wow. that showed me in my life that I wasn't capable of making everyone happy. Most of my life, I tried to make everyone I loved happy so I could be happy. Again, I went out to find my joy, which I should have found inside of myself. It was a rude awakening because I couldn't control any of their illnesses. I couldn't make things be different. And it was much, the depression was much 
more powerful and stronger and deeper than me simply taking bioidentical hormones. Bioidentical hormones do exist, and they do help women in, in many, many ways. Mine went much, much deeper, and it had to do with me letting go of a whole way of thinking uh, that I had held all my life that no longer worked. Because as we get older, different issues affect us that we can no longer just, you know, push away, that we have to actually walk headlong into. But you see, I believe that walking into those lousy things, those dreadful things, we do anything not to feel or experience, walking into them gives us the answers to things we would never look at when we were younger because we were busy and we didn't have to and we didn't have time. And coming out the other side of those is the joy, is the freedom, is the release from self-enslavement. You know, we're only unhappy because we have created realities that don't work for us anymore, and at some point we get to look at them and let go of them. You know, I... uh... I had the good fortune yesterday to spend the better part of the day with some friends of mine from China. Um, and we, we talked about a lot of things, Taoism, but uh, but filial piety and, uh, and the way that their, their culture turns and looks to their elders is something that I've, you know, I've, I've admired since I studied political science years ago in college. And one of the things that you say a part of the beauty of getting older is that we get wiser. We, we gain wisdom. Uh, I'm, don't let me put words in your mouth, but I believe that's uh, a, a fair paraphrase. Um, do you think that our society is negligent in taking advantage of that wisdom? And do you feel that, that if that's so, does that impact us as, as we do age? And in, in other words, Maybe we have the wisdom, but we're not treated as though we have the wisdom. Does that also impact us? Absolutely, because as a society, we're so fixated on youth. Nothing wrong with youth. Youth is a great time. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful time. But as you were saying, there are cultures. The Messiah recently this year spent uh, two weeks with the Messiah living in their little huts, you know, in their uh, little community, uh, and they have such a reverence. The elders are, when you're born, every age is respected. There's something beautiful. They help you understand about each season of your life, and the elders are known for their wisdom, and when they get to be a certain age, they get to be the elders so that the youth and the warriors and the people come to them and they impart that wisdom, and we certainly have not um, had enough respect or shown the beauty of of getting older and the wisdom that we have and the value we could have in society if we honored that. I, I totally, I totally agree. What would you say is the hardest part about the aging process? I think physically dealing with the body and the genetics, um, the breaking down where certain genetics come in with illnesses. My friend's macular degeneration, her mom uh, was practically legally blind when she passed, so that at certain points in aging, genetics do kick in heart failure, you know, different cancers, things like that. And I think uh, the most difficult thing is everyone you know and love has some kind of health issue, and that's why, for me, I walk an hour and a half every day. I do strength training a few times a week to keep my muscles strong. Physically, body-wise, it's it's like a wonderful thing. We have houses, we have cars, we keep them up, we do things, you know, to make sure they keep running. And sure. we somehow, as we get older, think we're supposed to back off a little and relax and what instead of maintain and and become interested in preserving ourselves in terms of our body and our mind, 
so that we can have these years and have still a very exciting life. Yeah. I think that is the greatest there's challenge. There's nothing we can't do if we are prepared and we take care of ourselves. This can be a very exciting time with our wisdom to be alive. We are, are more valuable. We love more. We're wiser. I mean, and now we have the rest of our lives to act this out. I love your attitude. Experts say the keys to successful aging include accepting changes and finding meaningful activities. So now, what activities do you find that are meaningful to you? How do you share those? I mean, do you teach those in your courses? And um, how are you doing with accepting changes, uh, the very ones that you're talking about? Well, um, firstly, I try. I try. I plan things. It's like visiting with the Maasai. That's not like your normal everyday thing you do when you're 69. Just go sit, you know, sleep outside in a sleeping bag and just mm-hmm. be with the Maasai. Uh, I try to do things that stimulate me. I try. I took up skiing a year and a half ago for the first time in my life. Um, I was on the bunny slope for forever, and I'm still, if you see me in Aspen um, <laughs> this, this year, you'll probably still see me on the bunny slope because I'm not a fool. You don't not do things like that and then suddenly <laughs> think, you know, you're going to join the Olympics. Uh, but... I try to do things that are new. See, change when I was young was an issue for me because I find I found that change was very vulnerable for me because, of course, if we do the same old, same old, we're safe, we're protected. Mm-hmm. So change is very invigorating. It's very exciting, and I try to change up my life by doing things I've never done before and to stimulate myself with it. That's fantastic, and that's exactly what the literature says you should ought to be doing, both from a physical and a cognitive standpoint. So now, what do you tell people as to how they deal with the typical fears that are involved with aging, such as, you know, the fear of losing one's independence um, and, and, you know, maybe ending up in an old folks home or, or, or that kind of thing? Wow, that is okay. Um you know, attitude is everything, and the freedom of choice is so powerful. We don't realize that in a moment, in a moment, if we change our attitude about something, we can change our mind and change our lives. How we see things makes a big, big, big difference. And if we can be with like-minded people, if you can find friends, you know, some people just love to play golf. They love to do sports. Some people love to do bridge. They love mind games. They, they can get together with like-minded people who support each other. And then also try not just to be with people who are so like-minded that they agree you should never walk or never exercise or never do anything. There's a balance in life. And in finding people who help, will, will help you share your uh, your passions, and then the weaknesses you have, like when I don't want to work out and I get into a mode, I always invite people to come over to do it with me, to walk with me, to do the workouts with me. We put on music, we laugh, we make it into something that helps us. I mean, I even say to women, if you don't like to work out, go window shopping before the stores open in the morning, just drive there. Go walk up and down the streets, look at all the things, just keep moving. Just go somewhere where you're happy to move, where you're happy. At least your eyes are looking at something. Find someone who can help you help yourself where you're weak. So, and then find people who want your strength in certain areas and support each other and understand that this is exciting. This is an exciting time of our life, not a thing we have to live through till we die. Yeah, yeah. You um, you have a number of speaking engagements that you do. Uh, I, I don't want us to run out of time without giving you an opportunity to to talk about that. Have you got events that are coming up? I know your the paperback release of uh, of your book uh, is due out. here pretty quick. Uh, the end of October, beginning of November, and 
and I shared a, a lot of things in my life in in my book with people, and um, I'm very open. Did you say we we're going to talk to somebody today? Is Did there I... people who can call in now, or is this? No, we we open the lines up for callers, but when okay. well, our experience is, of course, that when the flow of the show is such that the audience is interested in what we're saying, you get you get very few calls. Oh, okay. so so you're doing really well. Just keep it coming. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> hey, no, all I know is. One of the beauties, I'll be 70 this year, one of the beauties about being 70 is I got to walk through all those doors that I thought looked so great and then went, whoops, okay, what about this? Why, why am I not so pleased when I entered that door? And to share information with other women, it, to me, is such a joy because we are caretakers, caregivers. We love people, but, you know, when we learn to love ourselves, we love so much better. We love so, so much better. And that's why I'm encouraging women to find out who they are. For self-esteem, you have to actually walk into those little doors that aren't so nice, that self-criticism, and just change your mind in a moment. Like I was just saying, in a moment you can change your mind about who you are, how you look, how you feel about yourself. You can, re If you look at it, you can change anything. Right. You know, I, I just today posted, uh, it's been said that uh, it's all an illusion, and more accurately, it's all a perception. It is our perception of the world that that colors uh, how we respond to everything, and, and that includes our physiology. What are your thoughts, Linda, on reinventing oneself during retirement? I mean... For a long time, the data suggested that short of uh, deliberate suicide, the surest way to end life was to retire, you know, retire and you die. So today there's more and more people that are taking up vocations when they retire. They're turning their hobbies into things. Or like you, you know, you you, you love to cook and, and you began cooking more. And, uh, and, and, and indeed, your book shares wonderful recipes as well as parts of your life, et cetera. It's very well done. We talked about that last time. But what are your thoughts about having people take up enterprises of that nature, reinventing themselves, how they define themselves, as opposed to, you know, I'm retired now and I spend my day fishing or walking or whatever? Well, I totally understand that if somebody's worked all their life, nine to five, and they became an age where they could retire and have some money. That Real quick, because we have a caller that just has to speak to you. It's appealing for a while to retire, but boy, it's not going to last for very long. Okay, we'll talk to somebody, and then I'll continue the <laughs> Okay, all right. Thanks. Well, we have Susie on line one, and she is, uh, you know, I'm being flagged that this she really wants to say something. Uh, so let's welcome to the show, Susie. You uh, wanted to say something to Linda Evans. Uh, yes, actually, I've been listening to your show the second Linda uh, started talking, and I was in awe by it. I feel the same way about aging and doing um, cosmetic work. I, it, I don't know. I'm kind of contemplating also doing something, and I don't want to, but then I don't want to. I don't want to not. I want to get a tummy tuck, and I know it sounds silly, but it bothers me. So listening to her say if something bothers you and you want to, then you should. Because I don't want to feel vain. I, I don't think I'm vain, but I don't like my tummy. <laughs> so I just want to get it done. So I'm glad that she's talking about it. Well, it isn't that you should. Right. It's that you can look into it, find somebody who's done it, find somebody who does it really well, understand the pain that's going to happen if you're going to do something like that, and then say, you know, if, if walking around for the rest of your life and you don't have to deal with something that is uncomfortable for you, if it can go away, it can be done well, it, it's something you can afford, something that, you know, you can be supported in and go through, then consider it because it's what you want to do. Right. And I've been dealing with all this for about two years and I do other work. I mean, I go to the gym. I do everything I need to do, but I'm just, I can't get rid of this certain area. And you know what? I have a husband who supports it, who doesn't mind paying for it. So I want to get it done. But sometimes I think, 
you know, am I being vain? Am I being superficial? I, I, I don't know. I'm like sorry, that. Susie, but we're out of time. And, oh. and, uh, you know, I, 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 Linda, I really appreciate you coming to the show. And I, I guess, you know, earlier we mentioned that, uh, advice, uh, the wisdom that you gain, that that you teach uh, as a, re- a result of aging, uh, you are sharing now, and, and we have lots of people that are saying, thank you for sharing, and I want you to know that. That's what Susie is saying. That's what's coming out of the chat room. You do make a difference. And, uh, you know, well, we've come to the end of another hour of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank our guest and all of you for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed our show And we'll join us again next time, uh, same time and same place. And if you have comments on our show, do let us all know. Okay, until next time, remember, wherever you are in the world, believing in yourself always matters.